Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars share Iowa stories in the history of the state through a cultural history lens on the second and fourth Tuesdays of each month. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will explore how the U.S. Post Office Department's extension of rural free delivery in 1897 and parcel post in 1913 changed retail commerce in Iowa. We will examine advocates for progress and resistance from local merchants and commercial clubs across Iowa. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed in the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague, Matt Byer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sarah Johnson. Sarah is a public history consultant who conducts historical research, writes, and lectures about 19th to 21st century American history. Her knowledge of American material culture was honed through 20 years of teaching undergraduate and graduate design students to critically an analyze objects in museum collections within broader frameworks of culture, communications, and technology so they could become more informed designers and makers of objects. She has extensive public history experience working with museum collections, local historical societies, and on digital projects to make historical artifacts and images more accessible. She has nonprofit management and fundraising experience in capacities ranging from intern to trustee, and her academic work has been supported by major museum fellowships, including the National Museum of American History within the Smithsonian, the Winterthur Museum, and the Hagley Museum. She was also trained in curatorial practice at the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Costume Institute. She collects ephemera related to American department store mail order and is an expert in American retail history. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Sarah to begin the webinar. Great, thanks, Jennifer. I'm so pleased uh, to be here with you sharing this research. Um, so let's just dive in. Um, as Jennifer said, we're going to talk about three things today, uh, the development of department stores, rural free delivery, and parcel post, and how all of those things converge. Um, and we're going to start a little before um, uh, rural free delivery comes to Iowa um, to just give you a bit of con contextual uh, background for that. Um, this is uh, McLaughlin Brothers game, Uncle's, the game of Uncle Sam's Mail, um, that I think does a great chromolithographic uh, overview of um, what it took to get uh, the mails uh, throughout uh, the, the, um, this giant country of ours. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about um, my own background. I grew up on a family farm, <clears throat> uh, rural free delivery three, um, southeast of New Hampton, Iowa in Chickasaw County, uh, and where my grandparents um, started to farm uh, in 1920. Um, and that farm is still in the family. This is a photograph of some quilting ladies uh, that were making uh, wedding quilts for my paternal grandmother in 1918. Um, so in order to kind of get a visual sense of the differences between the stuff that was available to people then and the stuff that's available to us now and how we get it, um, I thought it would be um, good to just have a look at some photographs of what 
um, Iowa retail looked like. Um, and there's a lot of, this is kind of the golden age of postcards. So there's a lot of great images out there. Um, although many of them are not um, very well documented in terms of the information, I think, because that was, you know, they might have uh, a retail, local retailer might have sold the postcards in his store, um, his or her store, but they didn't necessarily have a caption about where that store was. Um, this one uh, was post postmarked Old Wine, Iowa in 1906. Um, so likely northeastern Iowa um, or thereabouts. Um, and you can get a sense of, you know, again, their uh, local retailers, local retailers everywhere um, had a much more finite um, collection of goods on offer. Um, the they um, again tended to support their local communities. Um, they would extend credit in, during hard times. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the issues that we'll talk about today, um, I think, are still playing uh, in American consumerism at this point. So um, if you wouldn't mind just kind of reflecting on your own practices about where you get your things um, and bring those to the discussion uh, at the end, that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, and so in order to um, compare this, um, it was it's trickier to find photographs inside of department stores. Um, this one is likely from the kind of 1920s, um, the interior of a New York department store. Again, my point here being that um, the big urban stores offered a, a much, much larger selection of things. Um, they had larger buying power, sometimes were manufacturing things in store. Um, generally speaking, they tended to have much more stylish or fashion forward things as well. Um, so this is again, the a Christmas display here with some Christmas shopping going on there. Um, and again, just to kind of back it up, um, mail order actually begins uh, significantly earlier than you probably think. Um, Benjamin Franklin was selling his stoves um, that way, but there's less mail order commerce um, in the late 18th and the first half of the 19th century um, for various and sundry reasons. Uh, there was no compulsory um, uh, you didn't have you, you didn't have to prepay postage so the person receiving the letter had to pay for that um, so it was more difficult to do mass mailings from that perspective um, and there was also just many fewer material goods in that period of time as well uh, but you could certainly buy books and uh, plant clippings and seeds and that sort of thing um, early 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 on um, but what I found in my dissertation research, um, uh, which I finished in 2004, um, was that in fact, um, department stores, New York department stores and other in, uh, other cities, Boston, Philadelphia, all of the cities really, um, begin to advertise um, selling things by mail. Um, and the image on the left says, all inquiries by letter promptly answered, lists of articles necessary for um, uh, blah, 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 with prices sent on application. Um, this is from Lord & Taylor, uh, a department store that actually uh, went out of business a couple of years ago uh, and was a kind of mainstay um, uh, in the early round of department stores uh, that started in New York in the 1820s. <clears throat> Um, so the, they are advertising things by letter um, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and there's certainly also uh, trade going on um, through traveling salesmen, uh, as well as circulars earlier, earlier before this. Um, and then again, another one of those great McLaughlin games, um, this one, the game of uh, playing department store, uh, where we get this uh, luscious chromolithographic um, take on all of these kids um, playing commerce. Okay, um, to just kind of uh, cruise along here, historically speaking. Um, so um, the importance of kind of going back into the 19th century is really just because um, it, it feel it could feel like all of this anger and animosity like suddenly builds in the 1890s. But in fact, um, it really starts uh, in the 1860s. Um, and during the American Civil War, 
post office, uh, post offices actually begin to deliver mail uh, in cities to people in cities. Um, so that feels a bit unfair to the farming population um, because their tax taxes are not providing the same sort of service. Um, so organizations like the Grange are certainly beginning to get on that particular bandwagon um, to get people um, focused on, again, um, uh, implementing uh, service uh, to rural areas, even though this is a much larger country than um, many of the European predecessor countries that are that are again um, doing mail delivery service um, much earlier than here. Um, but uh, again, as uh, mail order evolves, um, there are certainly catalogs um, that um, come into play by the early 1870s. Um, I, the earliest or the early, an early one that I found was um, from R.H. Macy, uh, a retail um, experiment that he had in Haverhill, Massachusetts, before he opens up in New York City. Um, this one is from Jordan Marsh. Um, from 1885, again, nice color illustration there um, on the catalog. And the uh, the illustration on the right is actually from an etiquette book um, from the early 1880s, um, where again, they are providing a format if you want to order things um, by mail um, so that you know how to do that. Um, again, to just kind of take some of the sting out of making mistakes, um, if you grew up in a family that you know, that didn't um, train you how to consume in these ways. Um, and A.T. Stewart, um, the company mentioned in the, in the, um, uh, on this, the image on the right, um, was also a, an, another one of the early retailers in New York, um, sets up shop in the 1820s, um, makes a whole lot of money during the American Civil War. Um, so uh, a lot of scholars have kind of written around the Civil War, um, but there's a lot going on, uh, even though um, that happens, that's happening. Um, and I've gotten really interested as my own research has evolved in thinking about disruptions um, and how um, things like financial panics and technological changes and communications changes um, have affected um, my own life, but also how they have affected consumers historically. Um, so uh, Montgomery Ward actually uh, is generally credited with um, beginning mail order, um, but again, we see that um, it's happening uh, well before um, he jumps on this particular bandwagon um, uh, in August of 1872. Um, this is a cover from his uh, from a little brochure that he that they publish um, in 1895. Um, and again, you know, he, they, the company uses the, you know, the originator of mail order, um, as you can see on the side of the building there on the back of that particular um, pamphlet. Um, and by the 1890s, uh, Montgomery Ward is not just shooting for farmers all over America, but they really see the world as, uh, um, as their territory, uh, which I think is really well illustrated on the back of that particular pamphlet. Okay, on we go. Um, I have three uh, um, of these postal cards um, with Iowa consumers. Um, if anybody has any of these knocking around um, in their family papers, I would love to have more of these uh, or just scans of more of these. Um, so um, here again, uh, so the process was that you would send away uh, your order um, after you got your catalog or after you had seen uh, something in, a, in an advertisement in a magazine or a newspaper, uh, you'd send your order in, um, you would get um, received by mail one of these postal cards um, to let you know that they had received your order um, and they were working on it and sometimes then how it would be delivered. <clears throat> So this one, uh, going to East Mapleton, Iowa, um, in 1879. Um, this one, uh, going to Laverne, Iowa, um, in 1889, uh, where they spent $9. Uh, and this one, again, acknowledging an order uh, from Old Wine, Iowa, um, from uh, uh, Hans, uh, a consumer named Hanson in Old Wine. Okay, um, so department stores um, really, really market 
um, mail order as a modern convenience um, that makes um, the woman's role as the family consumer a whole lot easier. Um, and this is an illustration, again, from the Christmas season. Um, it was the cover of Puck magazine, uh, December of 1913, uh, where you can see the kind of hustle and bustle of the crowds um, in a, you know, in a Christmas uh, department store toy department in this particular case. Um, so the retailers are saying, um, we're not saying don't come to the store, but if you can't come to the store or if you live too far away to come as often as you'd like, you can use mail order catalogs to get your shopping done that way. Um, and uh, there is, and again, the uh, as we kind of ease our way through the, uh, the course of the 19th century, um, John Wanamaker, who was a Philadelphia retailer, um, pictured in the upper right-hand corner um, of Frank Leslie's Illustrated Weekly, uh, was appointed postma uh, postmaster general um, in the Benjamin Harrison administration um, in 1889. Um, I don't think it's accidental um, that that happens. Um, and he had he's very pro RFD. Um, for all kinds of reasons, not least of all because he well understands um, the, the consumption power of the rural population uh, in America because there's so much of this country that's still uh, on the farm, proverbially. Um, so he is really, um, really uh, clued into the how all of that's going to work. Um, but politically, it doesn't go quite as he had intended. Um, uh, and not least of all, uh, one of the major concerns is how much it's going to cost um, to get um, postal routes to rural areas um, all the way across this country in some very isolated parts um, of, the, um, of America that don't necessarily have good roads. Um, so on the, the map on the right is actually um, in the digital collection at New York Public Library uh, from 1913 that shows his um, Metro New York City distribution points. Um, again, by, by the early 20th century, uh, retailers have figured out how to, how to just make that a well-oiled machine um, and um, are like not really missing too many tricks. Um, but there's quite a, one of the really challenging things that slows mail order and retail commerce down in the 1890s is um, a really serious financial panic that hits in 1893. Um, and then another one hits in 1897. Um, and, and quite often what happens when that, uh, when a financial panic ensues, um, is that a lot of retailers are struggling um, to stay in business um, as consumers have less and less money to spend. Um, so again, we'll see that uh, continue on as well. Okay, um, this is actually a copy of kind of a tattered copy of the House of Representatives bill um, that proposes um, rural free delivery uh, from October 25th of uh, 1893. Um, again, uh, it gets discussed and discussed and discussed uh, and they say, oh, it's gonna be really expensive. Uh, not so much, we'll put that off or we'll put aside a little bit of money. Um, and that can, that discussion um, carries on through the course of the 1890s generally um, until again, um, uh, 1896, as we'll see. Okay, so let's have a look at the, uh, at what we're seeing uh, in the period as the the pros and the cons of rural free delivery. Um, and the, the pros of rural free delivery come from a publication uh, called Rural Free Delivery um, that was published in 1899. Um, so um, they discuss, uh, increase, again, that this is gonna be a boon for um, increased postal receipts. Uh, many more people are gonna send letters, postcards, newspapers, and, and subscribe to newspapers and magazines. That certainly happens. One of the lesser known things is that it actually increases the value of farmland um, that's reached by rural free delivery from two to five dollars an acre, which was fairly significant. Um, it's certainly going to improve road conditions on rural free routes, rural free delivery routes. Um, and farmers will then have better access to prices, to farm prices, 
um, in order to um, sell their products, um, particularly with regard to the daily fluctuations in the state of the markets. Um, as well as there being uh, what was sold to them as the wholesome literature or the educational benefits of wholesome literature. Um, uh, we'll talk about that a little more as well. Um, so the downsides of rural free delivery, again, um, have to do with who's threatened by this, who's threatened, uh, whose livelihoods are threatened by this. Um, and that's, there's a number of uh, those people. Um, the star delivery route delivery men, uh, and they were nearly all men in this period of time, uh, were the, um, the guys who were like taking um, like taking delivering mail way off the beaten path. Um, so they were contracted out to do that. Um, and fourth class postmasters were running the really tiny post offices, um, again, on the kind of edges of villages. Um, uh, a lot of those, again, because when rural free delivery comes into play, a, a lot of those post offices wind up closing. Um, and a lot of times then the little tiny village that was built around them um, kind of fall to the wayside as well. Um, they tend to, rural free delivery um, tends to make farmers trips, trips to town unnecessary or less necessary or less frequent. Um, and that is going to have a significant impact on um, the small town merchants that a lot of times would house the post office, um, the local post office. <clears throat> so, again, people are going to come to town less frequently and probably buy less things. Uh, and John Wanamaker actually said there was only four reasons against uh, rural free delivery, and they were the four express companies, uh, because they clearly stood to lose from all of this as well. Um, and again, I should I, I should explain that um, at uh, before uh, uh, before parcel post, you could only send a package that weighed four pounds. So think about like a four pound bag of sugar. Um, it's not a it's not a big um, parcel by any stretch of the imagination. So anything over that had to be delivered. Um, to buy a buy a private express company, um, probably to a centralized location, perhaps the post office or the store, uh, where they would then send you a card to come and pick up your package. Okay, uh, this uh, is also from uh, the uh, the history of rural free delivery that was published in. Uh, 1899. Um, and this has, uh, again, a listing of the first rural uh, rural free delivery routes in this country. Uh, and we'll see the first ones for Iowa. I've badly highlighted them. Um, uh, they are uh, November 10th, 1896, uh, Morning Sun, Iowa, in southeastern Iowa, and uh, November 16th, 1896, Sun Prairie. And I'm not, I, I'm not sure, I think that might be West Des Moines but uh, I would be, if anybody has more intel on that, I would love to know. <clears throat> um, and in a contemporary sense, um, uh, Morning Sun, Iowa actually has a little rural free delivery postal museum that's run by a lovely woman, Joanne Bausch. Um, and my husband and I visited this summer when we were in Iowa, um, the outside of the building. And then there she is with uh, one of their rural free delivery wagons. Um, she also found just completely... Um, uh, with regard to happenstance, um, the original cubby holes uh, that um, uh, were in the post office there. So uh, she's just done an, a magnificent job in terms of local history um, of compiling artifacts um, in a very small space. Um, so yay for that. Um, and it's also interesting to see then how people are responding um, to these uh, rural free delivery routes. Um, you had to, if a, if um, farmers wanted to be served by a rural free delivery route, they actually had to get a hundred petition signatures. Um, and if anybody's done political petitioning, you know how hard getting signatures can be. Um, but this is one of those. It was one of those things that it didn't just happen accidentally. Um, you had to push. Uh, uh, your particular route forward and make sure that there was local support for that. Um, and it turns out that these uh, there are some of these testimonials in the annual report of the U.S. Postmaster General. Um, this one from 1898, um, uh, just some excerpts uh, or just one particular excerpt from the Iowa section. Um, this one being from Mount Pleasant. 
Um, and I'll just read the first one. Uh, it is a great benefit in more uh, than one way. The people nearly all uh, nearly all take daily papers and they have more interest to work the roads to keep them in good shape for the mailman. Um, they all have their boxes in a convenient place and our mail comes regularly every day. I've talked with two thirds of the people on this route about it. And the only fear is that it would not be kept up. B.B. Schaefer. Um, and then the other quote by H.C. Barker. Um, I would love in my dreamland uh, to find if those some of these families that give these testimonials are still in these towns. Um, anyway, that's where um, the public history takes a village part uh, where you all might be able to help me there. Okay. Um, this was actually a surprise to me, um, being a material culture person or a stuff person. Um, uh, I found this piece of rural free delivery stationery where you could actually fill in um, your rural free delivery route um, and write a letter to family members. Um, this one uh, letter dated um, uh, from Moulton, Iowa uh, from 1908. So you never know what you're going to find when you go looking. Um, and one of the really interesting things, I think, is how um, rural free delivery comes to represent a significant kind of social change that some people will call progress and other people will be very uh, leery of. Um, and there's a number of postcards. I, ha I have three or four um, different versions of, you know, the postman um, then... Um, uh, winding up with uh, romantic interest of some of the young women on his roots. Um, but one of the interesting things um, that I found, uh, again, in, in doing this research, um, and this one is from the Broad Axe, which was an African-American newspaper from Chicago, um, 1903, um, where they talk about women mail carriers. Generally speaking, uh, women were not allowed, but let me just read you this story because I think it's kind of incredible. It is discovered that nearly 25 women are serving as rural delivery mail carriers. No women are appointed as mail carriers in the cities, and the post office department is opposed to women doing such work anywhere, it being too severe for them. The appointments in the rural free delivery service would not have been made if it had been known that the candidates were women. Of the 8,500 rural free delivery routes in operation, June 30th last, so that would have been 1902, Iowa led with 771. Um, the other states having large number of routes were Ohio, Illinois, Indiana. Uh, and the average number of pieces of mail handled on each of the routes each day was 132. Um, that's coming to us from the Detroit Free Press. Um, so it's interesting to see, again, how it is that different constituencies, women, um, African-Americans, are um, keeping an eye on this. And certainly um, in Leo Landis's last presentation, last Iowa History 101 presentation, he talked about The Bystander, uh, which was the big African-American newspaper in Des Moines. And there's, they're certainly kind of watching all of uh, the this folding out as well. Okay. Um, a real photo postcard here uh, with a handwritten notation on the back, an RFD uh, mailman in Decorah, Iowa. Um, I've been working with the um, Historical Society there to see if we can't figure out who this is. Um, but again, a lot of times, especially with these real photo postcards, um, there just is no information. So you're kind of on your own. Um, and the other um, aspect of, uh, again, people getting a great more, a great deal more mail and a great, uh, a much greater access to information um, had to do with the burgeoning of um, things like, again, um, postcards and stationery and newspapers and magazines and the proliferation of those, again, because there's this new market, there's this, um, there's this whole do. Uh, rural market. Um, photograph on the left is from the National Postal Museum's burgeoning service section about all of this. They do a really great job of talking about um, service, again, the post office department's servicing of um, the entire country by mail. But it's sort of interesting to then take that to Iowa 
Um, and um, the father, Henry C. Wallace, not Henry A. Wallace, um, in his Wallace's Farmer publication, um, was a bit concerned about uh, this proliferation of uh, literature um, and said something said something variously that um, that he was afraid that they would just wind farmers would just wind up reading trashy literature. So um, anyway, uh, I think it's interesting to see these perceptions about you know what it is that people will read when they can actually consume a lot more information. And then um, uh, by 1897, uh, department stores throughout this country are really being viewed as a threat. Um, and a number of states attempt to make uh, department stores a legal form illegal. Um, and that, um, there's a really great article by a, um, a historian of technology and kind of an urban environmental historian now uh, called Joel Tarr. Um, and he was the one that, an article that he wrote in the early 1970s about the anti-department store movement in Chicago uh, was really the one who kind of tipped me off to this, um, this whole struggle um, that again gets really heated um, and involves a lot of people um, throughout the Midwest region and nationwide. Um, so this is a postcard <clears throat> uh, that says war. Uh, dear sir, uh, so it's the beginning of February or end of February of 1897. The next regular meeting of the 31st Street Businessmen's Association will be held. Um, uh, Senator Moses Salomon will honor the association with his presence and address the meeting on the evils of department stores. Uh, we trust every member will be present to give him a hearty welcome. Um, this was sent to somebody again called J.B. Chapin, um, Chapin uh, in Chicago itself. So um, it's interesting, I think, to see that even in Chicago, there's, uh, you know, these, um, the businessmen's associations um, and these associations of retailers are attempting to band together um, to, to fight um, uh, the, again, what's seen as the threat of um, the encroachment of department stores. Um, that certainly rural free delivery and then parcel post will enable. Um, and um, this is another one, again, uh, New York State was also uh, one of those trying to make department stores illegal. Uh, we propose to cooperate with and not against the local dealer in his battle against the encroachments of mail order houses. That one mailed from Chicago in 1901. It's unclear kind of from whom, that's probably not accidental. Um, and I have not yet had a chance to do any research about this fellow. It's uh, addressed to Washington Chase in Newcomb, New York. But on the right, uh, we have a little funny snippet from the Postville Review uh, from October 15th of 1897. His fear, Rickson, why don't you vote for uh, Platter, the anti-department store candidate? And Dixon says, I'm afraid if they abolish the department stores, my wife will want a bigger allowance. Um, so again, the point there being the, the, the humor in that is that um, she will need more, his wife will need more money to shop locally because the prices are higher. But there will be other costs as we will see. <clears throat> this is a 1901 advertisers directory. Again, the, um, the advertisers and printers in this period of time are also um, spending a lot of ink on how to, in this case, sell to country people. Um, and um, the, this particular agency uh, uh, in Philadelphia um, has a strategy that you can pay them for. Um, there's a lot of that going on in this period of time that again, um, just um, suggests that um, there's a lot of money to be made um, and a lot of different ancillary industries um, related to mail order that, um, that are jumping on the bandwagon as well. Um, and department stores don't really miss a, any tricks about that. Um, so this is a, a, a postal card from R.H. White, a department store in Boston. Um, again, it, relatively rare to get um, uh, photographs inside of department stores in this period of time. Um, so it's valuable for that um, of the women's suit department here. Um, but I think the inscription is what's interesting to me. I am in the waiting room at this store all the postals you want free. 
Um, so uh, very clever advertising on the part of RH White because um, consumers didn't have to buy the postcards. They would provide them, but then that was advertising um, for them. So it's that it's they were they were willing to spend money um, to to get kind of free advertising, if you will, because then the you know the consumer was going to put the stamp on this to send to their friends. Um, and it's also interesting to see this is a kind of specialty catalog that Wanamaker's um, publishes in 1906 that looks like a little, uh, you know, the doors of the store then open. Uh, Wanamaker's doors are never closed to mail order buyers. Uh, within our money saving suggestions for your springtime needs. Um, and then I just opened up one of the sides of this so you could see um, this is a much smaller little kind of catalogette, if you will. Um, there's about, I don't know, probably 12 or 15 pages. Um, and you can fill out uh, if you're going to order something and send them back in, as you can see on that um, side um, view there. Um, but the point there is that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what time of day it is, you can still get your shopping done. Okay, um, I don't know if there are any of these from Iowa, um, but there was a postcard publisher called Frank Swallow um, in Exeter, New Hampshire, who does a whole series of um, these humorous postcards. Um, and this one is the postmaster and his assistant. Um, and it says, it took so much time to read the postcards and now we must find out what is inside all of the parcel post packages in Hoosick, New Hampshire. Um, so so there's a lot of that sort of humor um, that, again, kind of digs into small town life because clearly the postmaster knew who was ordering things from away. And, um, uh, and so it's just an interesting, I think, social commentary in terms of how um, these debates are playing out and taking place. And we'll see that evolve as well. Um, and I just threw in a couple of these because they really are kind of hilarious. Um, this one, um, the RFD parcel post wagon. Um, we know it wasn't, a, the, the mailmen weren't um, delivering these with wheelbarrows. Um, and I would be very scared if that cat, the size of that cat came to my house. But um, anyway, you, you'll see how these, um, get oversized and um, there's a lot of hyperbole in them. And this one, the 200 ton parcel post truck um, coming to us in Sanford, Maine, um, where again, uh, the, we have all manner of consumer goods being shipped there. Okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, Iowa's own uh, Ding Darling, the cartoonist, the satirical cartoonist, um, he has a take on Parcel Post, um, March 24th, 1914, where, again, the farmer's produce on the, uh, the left side of the image um, are, are just jumping completely over um, the middlemen here in the middle, the grocers, the express companies, and the commission men and brokers, um, and into the guy with the basket on this side. Um, there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, satirical illustrations of um, that are that are quite sharp um, about local retailers. Uh, you know, you'll there's there's a really great one from the 19th century where there's a cat sitting in the front window on top of the butter. Um, but it's important because I think that um, a lot of farmers sold um, excess produce that they had to those local merchants, in, sometimes in exchange for goods or, um, again, to, uh, uh, you know, to balance that out on credit. Um, and uh, we'll see that coming into play as well. Um, Okay, um, Iowa becomes particularly important to this story because in the early 20th century, um, it's undergoing a lot of population loss. Uh, it, it has one of the biggest uh, population losses um, in the country. Um, and again, if particularly to cities, um, some of that is likely because of, um, again, how long uh, it takes um, the country to pull up and out of uh, financial depressions and recessions. Um, so it, I think that that dynamic, that rural urban uh, rural urban dynamic, um, uh, is kind of constantly playing in the background in this country. 
Um, again, the postcard on the right is um, for a suit company uh, from 19, uh, early 19 teens, um, showing us Fifth Avenue, a very stylish part of Fifth Avenue. Um, and I've juxtaposed that image with, again, some, um, some farm guys, um, you know, alongside what looks like their chicken coop, probably. Um, and I think that that particular, again, the kind of the call of the city um, when things are really hard on the farm uh, must have been hard to ignore. Um, and um, and was true across the country. And you'll see my husband has done some writing about um, old home week um, festivals in New Hampshire, his home state, um, again, that were trying to get people, draw people back um, who had left and gone to the city. Um, this particular um, photo postcard uh, is of the post office in Perry, Iowa. Um, a couple of interesting things going on here. Um, again, when Parcel Post comes to the fore, which is the beginning of January of 1913, um, they need bigger buildings and bigger trucks to deliver the mail. Um, so it's at that period of time, particularly and after in the teens, the course of the teens, that a lot of towns get new post offices or bigger post office buildings. Um, and there's a lot of postcards with them um, kind of marketing that, um, if you will. Um, but this one, um, the one in Perry, Iowa, um, the sign on the front there says, ship by parcel post, uh, 100 inches in length and girth combined, uh, 70 pounds, because eventually it was raised to 70 pounds in weight, cheap rates and quick service to all zones. Um, but I have a nice, I just want to read you a quick um uh, um, uh, editorial from the Daily Chief, which was the newspaper in Perry, Iowa. The parcels post, the harvest of the mail order houses will begin after January 1st, when the parcels post will have been established in the post office department. This measure, measure has been agitated for years and the and opposition to it has been branded as reactionary, while the idols of the people have been urging its adoption on the grounds that it was progressive in character and will afford great convenience to the people, not to mention the increased deficit in the post office department department, which will result in its inauguration. Um, anyway, it goes on um, to, to much more cautiously approach this particular uh, debate. And um, it's, it, it's really interesting to see how local towns, newspaper editorials um, respond to this, because it, quite often it is not well. Um, and then that brings us to uh, one of the um, uh, American historians Thomas Schlereth, who's written a lot about um, mail order catalogs, um, has a kind of material culture approach to using mail order catalogs to teach American history that I have employed myself. Um, he was the one who um, discovered um, these hometown industry jubilee and bonfires. And what's going on here is that um, a lot of times the commercial clubs um, or the uh, merchants associations would band together um, and ask consumers to bring their mail order catalogs in to town, um, usually then give them some sort of token um, to kind of cash back, if you will, to spend in their store um, and um, get rid of the mail order catalogs. Um, so I found one of these in uh, Cedar Falls, Iowa, um, and have to thank a couple of people here. Um, uh, Julie Huffman Klinkowitz at the Cedar Falls Historical Society uh, helped me to do some research about uh, Frank McCreary here on the left. Um, he was a local band leader, uh, taught music uh, at what was then Iowa State Teachers College, what is now UNI. And full disclosure, I'm an alumni. Go Panthers. Um, so the information uh, here that we see about him underneath this photo is from the Cedar Falls uh, City Directory, and I thank Julie for that. Um, and the photograph itself is from Tessa Wakefield and J.C. Voss uh, Special Collections uh, at the UNI Archives, and I thank them for that. Um, but um, the uh, the editorial here is from the Keokuk, Keokuk's Daily Gate City newspaper in 1912, um, again, that uh, says, 
Uh, Professor F.L. McCreary, secretary of uh, Cedar Falls Commercial Club, has inaugurated a new idea of advertising. Um, so they talk about this bonfire that happened. Um, I can't find any photographs of it, um, um, but the, the scenario is also discussed in George Bil Milburn's later novel uh, from 1936 called Catalog. Um, he was a very popular short story writer, um, and I have to give you a bit of a trigger warning there because there's some kind of heinous uh, racial violence that happens um, as a result of um, this the catalog burning um, uh, the hometown industry jubilee and bonfire that they have there. Uh, he grew up in Oklahoma. It's set in Oklahoma, but I think largely it could have been set anywhere in this country uh, for quite a lot of the 20th century. Um, and then ma uh, mail order catalogs, again, get back to um, talking to uh, their consumers about how to best use parcel post uh, when it gets put into play. This one, this illustration from awards catalog um, from 1916, um, again, giving you very specific instructions about how to best utilize those services. Um, and um, and I think the uh, I've chosen to to bring this to conclusion because I think it's ironic and uh, really great um, that by the by the mid teens farmers have figured out for themselves how to use parcel post to their own best advantage. Um, and this is from a, a little brochure called Parcel Post Profit from Farm Produce, um, teaching farmers how to, in fact, um, do their own advertising and market their goods uh, on at least a regional basis, I would imagine. Um, and I and inside this, um, I, I decided on this clip because it has the farm to table section, um, which I think is particularly apropos given the way things are now um, and how timely these discussions are to the way the the way retail has evolved then throughout the course of the rest of the 20th century and into the 21st century. Um, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks for you all for attending. Um, Public History Takes a Village. Uh, if anybody has family photos or information, if you have um, some uh, somebody who was in a merchant's association or a rural free delivery person, um, please contact me. Um, there's my email address. Uh, I am grateful for the research grant that I have received from the State of State Historical Society of Iowa that's made a deeper dive into this research possible. Um, if you're interested in this, there will be a forthcoming article in the Annals of Iowa. And I am also grateful um, with uh, appreciative thanks to all the previous scholars, uh, historians, local history people, uh, historical societies, and everyone who's worked on digitization projects um, because those efforts have contributed so greatly to my own. Um, now over to questions. Yeah, well, thank you, Sarah. We have time to answer some questions. If you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A feature right here on Zoom. Uh, but please note, as always, we may not have time to get to all the questions. So let's dive in. Um, our first question, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, before rural mail delivery, how did folks in rural areas receive correspondence? Um, great question. Okay, so they had to hitch up their wagon and um, go into town uh, and pick their mail up at the post office. Um, and so quite often, uh, if you read letters from the pre-rural free delivery period, um, quite often they will, you know, people will say something like, I'm just dashing off this quick note because X and such is going to town. Um, and that would, that's why um, quite often that, you know, if you, you had to get your letters to the post office uh, whenever somebody was going. Um, and, and that was usually much less frequently. Um, again, especially if you think about Iowa winters and, um, you know, impact passable roads, so. The next question is about competition between companies. Um, mm. So did Montgomery Ward offer mail order commerce before Sears Roebuck? And um, if they did, how did they compete with each other to gain more people shopping? Sure. Um, yes, actually, um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, yes, yeah, Sears does. Sears actually is a railroad man, um, and he doesn't start. He gets a, a case of watches um, that he then winds up buying and selling. Um, and uh, he starts. So Montgomery Ward starts in 1872 in Chicago. Um, Sears starts in 1893. 
Um, but they, uh, they both are, uh, again, develop extreme hyperbole when it comes to, you know, having the greatest and the best goods um, addressing the, you know, again, the rural market and that sort of thing. Um, I think that generally speaking, uh, retail competition was, was wicked fierce. Um, so that when somebody starts doing something, when somebody adopts a new fangled something, um, product or service, um, the likelihood is that all of the other retailers are going to have to jump on board or they're going to lose business. Um, so I think retail is really one of those businesses, it's one of those industries that looks easy from the outside, but if you've ever worked in retail, you know, or owned a store, uh, you will understand how that it is significantly more challenging than it looks from the outside. But that's a great question. Thanks. Um, in your research, did local small town merchants also protest mail order? And did their business struggle with the advancement of mail commerce? Uh, yes. Um, and that I'm hoping that um, in the, I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time reading things to you, um, but I have a lot to read to you about that. Um, so uh, in I will uh, address that um, a lot more in the article that I'm writing for Annals of Iowa. But the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, there was a lot of ink spilled um, in the local newspapers. Um, and again, a lot of those available, uh, digitally available to us now. Um, so that's one of the reasons I'm enormously grateful for all of those previous digitization efforts, because it allows for us to look at places that, um, you know, from the comfort of our own offices, um, that you could not have looked at before. Well, let's switch actually to uh, your research and everything you've been looking through. Um, sources are always great to dig through. Did you have a favorite source while doing your research? I have to confess, I really love those funny um, kind of fantasy postcards uh, from Frank Swallow. Uh, and I don't know if other uh, if other postcard publishers across the country were doing this a, a similar kind of, you know, poking fun at um, at this process. Um, but uh, th I think that those are those really made me laugh out loud. I have to say, um, I found I recently, just a couple of days ago, found um, that uh, uh, a farm implement. Um, like an annual conference of those dealers um, were talking about how to deal with, again, the encroachment of people buying farm equipment. Um, because again, uh, while it may have, while mail order may have started off with smaller kinds of consumer goods, it certainly, you know, um, continued, the size of things continues to grow, particularly with um, uh, rail delivery and, um, uh, and such. Uh, and then, you know, the delivery of things to people's houses. Um, but you, I mean, you could buy a house kit, you could buy a plow, you could buy all kinds of uh, giant things that then would have to be delivered to your house. Um, so uh, it was, it, it, there's a broad spectrum of um, very heavy things. Does that answer the question? Or it does. And actually, it's a great transition to the next question. Oh, good. Um, perfect. In your research, did you come across what was the most common things that were sent by mail delivery? Um, it's hard to quant. It, uh, one of the one of the frustrating things I have to say about this research is that um, a lot of uh, people, uh, well, some some of the people who've written it, but there's not a lot of people who write about retail history, to be honest. Um, but of those who have done, um, they they talk about mail order as if it is a much smaller portion um, of um, retail and wholesale sales. Um, I'm beginning to wonder if that if there isn't a, a bit of challenge to that, again, particularly because of how virulent um, the anti-department store movement gets going in the by the end of the 1890s. Um, and a lot of that's driven by the financial, the, again, how bad the financial panic is. Um, I've recently been going through um, my own family's um, kind of archival material um, and found some, uh, an oral history that was done uh, by somebody in my grandfather's generation. Um, so those kids were born kind of 1880s to 1890s. Um, and they, they, somebody remembered that, you know, they couldn't get any credit after the panic in 93. Um, so I think that again, um, 
financial panics are one of those things that that seem like we can be cavalier about from a distance but i think when you're living that as we have now lived that um both you know from the big banking crisis um, last decade, and then you know what COVID has done to um, to us in the meantime. Um, that I think again, those kinds of disruptions um, are felt across the spectrum, both production uh, and consumption. And this will be our last question for today. Um, let's end with uh, about you. How did you become interested in researching this topic? Uh, that's actually a really good question. Um, I, I was always, uh, well, uh, so both of my parents were antiquers. So as children, we were um, exposed to a great deal of the material culture of Iowa because of um, being taken to antique shops. Um, and so that's where my love of the 19th century comes from, I think. Um, and I was always fascinated with mail order catalogs because we uh, again, I have to confess and say we were one of those, you know, one of the families who was um, sending away for things um, or going to bigger towns. I mean, we would usually go to Waterloo or to Rochester, Minnesota to do our shopping um, and um, or or get things by mail. Um, uh, we did not generally go to the, the local store. There was a local department store. Um, uh, and we did, we certainly did get some things from, there was a, a penny store, there was a Sears counter, um, I don't remember about wards, uh, to be honest, in the little town that I grew up in, in Northeast Iowa, New Hampton. Um, but, uh, I think that a lot of that, again, um, kind of then sort of trickled back. Um, and I too was, um, you know, left, left the farm during the 1980s farm crisis, um, and, um, moved to New York. And uh, it's been interesting to, to me to see then how um, that kind of urban rural dynamic has affected my own life. That's great. And with that answer, we will bring this webinar to a close. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us today. And we'd like to extend one last thank you to presenter. Sarah, thank you so much. This has been fascinating today. Great. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Now, we hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for our future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some other fantastic programs. We have our Goldie's Kids Club activities from historians as well. We look forward to virtually seeing you here on Thursday, October 27th. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thank you.